I want to read you a scripture. When I do my preparation, 90 plus percent of everything I do, I start with scripture. And a lot of times I don't put anything else there. I let the Holy Spirit administer that scripture to us, including myself, because I feel that's a more sure word, a more perfect word. So I've always tried not, I will tell you, I do a lot of different translations. And so I might say something that doesn't sound like the King James, but I always have a scripture. And you gentlemen, most of you gentlemen, get a teaching every, or get a scripture every morning. I once in a while will put a little of my own thoughts in it, but for the most part, it is a translation of the Bible. I like the Passion Translation because it's translated from the Aramaic, and the Aramaic language is the language that Jesus spoke, not the Greek. And so I like, I like that idea that somebody has come up with this. And, and of course, there's Latin translations, which the Roman Catholic Church uses, and then, and then, of course, the Greek, which is the typical King James, probably the most popular of our Bibles. But I want to start with this. Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. And what is supplication? Asking. Not complicated, is it? By talking to God and asking Him. Prayer and supplication. Asking. I got a friend, and you guys, most of you guys know Steve Rhodes, and he's been a friend of mine since 1969, where I met him in college. He's a great baseball player. And I played on a championship team at Miami. They were rated in the top 10 in the United States during those years. But when we get together, we'll be talking about something, and he'll look at me and say, ask her. Ask her. He's talking about Siri. <laughs> so I have to ask Siri. So there's the answer. <laughs> ask her. Ask him. And I promise you, he'll give you an answer according to his word. And you have precious and magnificent promises. According to New American Standard, you have precious, America, uh, precious and magnificent promises being given to you that you can become a partaker of his divine nature. Does God lose? Well, wait a minute, brother. Don't you understand how messed up our country is right now? Does God ever lose? Oh, well, you don't understand Israel got invaded, and there's a lot of people that are against Israel. And, oh, my gosh, there's so many people going to be anti-Semitism or whatever they call it. Does God ever lose? Who cares about any of those people? Be anxious for nothing. Quit worrying about what the United States is saying, or, or, or not the United States. Let me back up on that. Forget about what the news media is saying. Forget about what the liberal folks are saying. Forget about what the non-churchgoers are saying. Forget about what the churchgoers are saying if they're caught up in it. 
I just heard a, a, a very famous minister, you would all know him. He just he said one of the great concerns he has is how, how much the church has got itself caught in the world. And most of it is money driven. You know, you can't have peace when you do that. God's going to bless you, but let him do it. Quit trying to get blessed. The Bible says God will bless you. I've turned down so many different things in my life because I know in my heart, I don't want anybody to be in a place where they can say, look what I did for Doyle. You know what that does for me? That brings me peace. Everything that I've ever accomplished, I know where it came from. I cannot have in my mind a spirit of pride. See what happens when you go out there and you do it yourself? It isn't long when you're saying, whew, ain't I special? Aren't I something? Or you go to some school somewhere and you get a little bit of education and you say, and, and you succeed, well, look what, you know, it's, it's my education. You know how many people have asked me in my life, where'd you go to college at? Because they just can't figure out how I could be blessed and not have gone to college. That's their spirit. Where'd you learn how to draw those houses? Where'd you learn how to build them like that? We were building our homes. I was doing 37, 40 houses at a time. And we were doing it in 42 working days. Builders all over the United States were wondering how I was doing it. And I said, not only that, I'm not doing it in subdivisions, which 99% of them did. I was scatter site. I was doing 75 miles that way and 75 miles that way. You know how I did it? I asked God for wisdom. And if you ask him for wisdom, he's not going to give you a stone. If you ask him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. He will give you wisdom because he's excited about you having wisdom. Are you excited about your children having some wisdom? And those that don't have any wisdom, wouldn't you be excited if they got some? Why would God be any different? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father, being totally righteous, will do good things for you? How does it come? You have to believe. You have to believe it. Wow, bless God, I'll believe it when I see it. You'll never have it. The blessings of the Lord maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow to it. Why? Because you know where it came from. Do you understand? You know that you know that you know that God made it work. He used your hands. But I know a lot of people who've been busy with their hands all their life and have nothing. So it isn't just, I'm going and work and work and work. You can work your finger to the bones. You can work day and night. I know of a gentleman that works at General Dynamics. He works uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. You know what, when he dies early, what good is it? No time for God. God's in, in the background. And that's what happens when we get caught up into making money. God says, I don't want you to make money. I want to be a blessing. I want to do what you do with seeds. You do know that you can't make a seed grow, but you can plant it. And you can let God do the rest of it. Step out in faith. Walk in the principles. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't run another way. Follow his word. 
If you're not into this word, you ought to at least be reading the stuff I send you. That's the easiest thing you can do. Everything is handed to you on a silver platter. And you're not taking the time to read it? you got to be kidding me. It's God talking to you. I'm sending it, but it's God doing the talking. And he wants to talk to your heart. He wants to talk to you, your spirit man, and, and let change that to be like him. I didn't say the Holy Spirit. I said your spirit man. You have a spirit. Do you understand? Something got born again. And it wasn't your brain and it wasn't your body. Something got born again. That's your spirit, man. And every human being on earth is born with a spirit. You're born with a body and you're born with a mind. And that's what God meant when he was talking to Nicodemus. And he says, marvel not what I say to you, Nicodemus. You have to be born again. But Lord, I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. What the world are you talking about? He wasn't spiritually minded, and yet he was a great teacher, probably the greatest teacher in all of Israel at the time. And he come to Jesus by night, didn't want too many people knowing about it. How can I do that? He said, what's born of the spirit is spirit, and what's born of the flesh is flesh. So you're born with the spirit. Your flesh is born with the spirit, and God wants it changed. Because it wasn't how he created us. Adam and Eve was perfect in every way. That's how he created us. But the beauty of Jesus, 4,000 years later, is he made us just like him again. But this time, we have to choose it. It's not an automatic. So you can choose it. And you can live in this passage of Philippians Chapter 4. He wants us to that nook. <clears throat> he wants us to be anxious for nothing. And in everything by prayer and supplication. What's the rest of it? With thanksgiving. What's a thankful heart like? What is your heart like when you're thankful? Joyful. Joyful? Anybody else? What's your heart like when you're thankful? Generous. Generous. Peace. Peace. Satisfied. Those are all part of it Thanksgiving ascends faith faith the Bible says in all things give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus a thankful heart is the heart that says look what Jesus has done You can't have any pride. You can't have any arrogance. You can't have any better than thou. You can't look down on anybody if you have a thankful heart. Because the essence of a thankful heart is one that recognizes Christ in me, the hope of glory. There's nothing that I need because he meets my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So when you get Christ Jesus, you got it all and you all have it. As far as I know, every single one of you is born again. You're all at different levels. And as God is developing leadership in this body here, this group of men, 
these men are the ones that are becoming more and more conscious of Christ in them. They're becoming more and more conscious of this is how the kingdom of God works. It works through a spirit of peace. God wants us to let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. I'm talking tonight about peace. For you men who are taking on leadership roles, every single posting, every single teaching that I have done since March of 19 or uh, 2015 is a teaching lesson that you can take and you can develop it into a lesson for your family. You can develop into a lesson for your friends, and you can develop it for a lesson in a Bible study that you may lead. You can develop it into a lesson for ministering to a group of people. I have two men so far in this group that I give this pulpit to from time to time, or whatever we call this thing, this place of authority and leadership that the gods made me responsible for. And you men can use those teachings when you teach. And let the Holy Spirit lead you in the scriptures and in the word that he has in those things. And you guys can have that same leading every day. Every day. You can read that and you can say, Holy Spirit, take those words and teach me how to use them. Teach me how... To do so. so every day you have something handed to you. And one day, when you're faithful in the little things, God will make you ruler over much. That's what he told me a long time ago. So instead of focusing on what everybody else is doing and how everybody else is doing it. And I've told you guys many, many times, every step of faith that I've ever taken, I've never shared it with anybody. It was between me and God. Because God showed me through the scriptures that man was not going to give me my answer. He said, don't ever depend on man. He said, you depend on me. Now, you may get benefits from man, but always be thinking on these teachings that you guys are reading and studying and sh or should be, always be thinking about what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. I may have something specific I'm trying to say, but it may not be what he's saying to you. Do you understand? That's what revelation knowledge is. And I just, I, I just want you to have it. I, or I want you to walk in it. Because when God reveals himself to you, I may be talking about widgets and he's talking to you about hammers. And it doesn't matter to me because it's he that is led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So when I present something, this is from my spirit through the Holy Spirit. And many of the examples I've given you guys and I've taught you, I've taught you through my spirit that God has taught me. And I've, and I've instructed you, this is what the Holy Spirit has taught me, my human spirit. That's what he has taught me about what the word has to say. And he put, I put it into practice and it became an experience. And experiences is really important. 
for you to have. It's not the answer. The answer is the Word of God and faith. It's believing what the Word says. But it translates itself into experiences in your life because you're all unique and you're all wonderfully made and you are designed the way you are. So don't try and change who you are. Just learn what the Holy Spirit has to say because those are principles. Just put them in you. Put them in your head. Renew your mind and prove that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But you got to renew your mind. Man, I'm giving you all these opportunities. And all of it is for that one purpose. I don't want you to just take an hour of your life to listen to something I have to say. That means nothing to me. But what means something to me is when I see you're changing and becoming like Christ. That has great value. And those of you who are personally close to me, I'm seeing that change. And that's what makes me excited. Because I feel like I'm accomplishing something. I get no ego out of you doing something that, hearing you say some, something I said. I, I, I was back at the back, back uh, countertop here the other day. Talking to a gentleman, and I said, You got to do the things that you hate to get to the things you love. If you don't get that, you'll never succeed in life, whatever that is, whatever God has expected you to do. You got to do the things you hate to get to the things you love. And that person asked me, where's that in the Bible? What did Jesus say to the Father when he's going to the crucifixion? What else? Did you hear that? Not my will, but yours. What else did he say? He said, sir, can you take this cup from me? I'm not really, I don't want to do this. Take this cup from me. I don't want to do it. Steve, yes, sir. You're not going to Atlanta. What? I'm a builder. There hasn't been a home built in Lima, Ohio for three years. You're not going to Atlanta, son. You're going to stay here. That's what I want you to do. I had to learn to do the thing that I hated. I hated to not have work. I wanted to be a big builder. And I couldn't get there here. This town went from 55,000 to 25,000 in less than three years. All the factories left. I had to do the thing that I hated to get to the thing I loved. When I first went into business, I had to frame houses because I had zero money. I had to frame houses for three years, four years. I hated getting it up in the morning. I hated it. But I was always up at dark. I got out in my truck and I went to work. Every day, including Saturdays. I hated it. And one day the Lord said to me, you're done with that now, son. 
Because when I was talking to him about it, I said, sir, I hate this. Talk to him. Tell him your, he knows your heart anyways. Just get it out. I hate doing that. I told him that. But Lord, I'll do this for the rest of my life if that's what I got to do. I've settled it in my heart. It's a done deal. And nobody ever questioned me about it. And nobody even knew what was in my heart. Nobody. You like working in the rain? You like working when it's 20 degrees? You like putting heating and air conditioning equipment in at 60 years old? There's a lot of things I hated to do. But I just said, Lord, I know this is important for me. So not my will. What else did Jesus say? But your will. And I learn the essence of lordship in the things that I suffered. Do you understand? Well, how long do I have to do this? Till the reason that you're doing it is complete. Because there's a reason that you're doing it and it has to do with your life and how it's out of control it's undisciplined it's unruly and it needs to be brought in line and when that's complete he'll say well done thou good and faithful servant not everything but on that thing that he's working with you on. When it has its completeness in your life, when it has its perfect work in your life, in that it's molding you and shaping you to learn to trust him. Yes, you're going to hate it. You're not going to like it. If you happen to be one of those guys, say everything that happens in my life is just absolutely what. I don't even know anybody like that. Maybe there is, but I don't know. Some of you are there, still there. Maybe it's more a surrendering to the Holy Spirit and letting him have your life because he knows how to do more with it than you're going to do with it. Because had I not gone through that, had I not been tested, had I not been stuck in the fire and pulled out and pounded on and pounded on and pounded on, those are the things you hate. But it's molding you and shaping you to be a sword and not a piece of steel. Because nobody can use a piece of steel. It's got to have some kind of shape or form. It's got to be built into something useful. If not, it's just a piece of steel. So many folks are just running around like a piece of steel. The world is, for sure. The church shouldn't be. God says, I want to make you something. You know what he wants to make you? What he has planned for you since the day you were born. And you may not even know what it is. I didn't, but he has a plan. And that plan is to bring you a future and a hope and a peace that passes all understanding, guarding your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus.
I'm doing a teaching right now and, and the teaching I send out. That's out of Proverbs 16, 7, and that's my basic for teaching. It's why the reason I'm doing this is you young men that are moving yourself into leadership. I want to show you this is how you do it. You can do this all the time. You can take these words that I speak to you and you can minister to people everywhere you go. You can minister as a teaching. Just got, just got to just develop it. And I've got, I don't know, close to 3,000 teachings now in my 10 years. You all be able to find one in there. Help change somebody else's life. This is what I'm here for. See, if I hadn't gone through those trials and I hadn't gone through those struggles and I hadn't been gone through all those times of, of impossibilities, I wouldn't be able to stand here in boldness and talk to you. I wouldn't be able to do it. You got to have experiences. Would Paul been able to write after what is it, two-thirds of the New Testament? Some say less, some say more. If he hadn't been in prison, do you know what kind of prison he had? Have you guys ever thought about it? He's in prison. Did a lot of his writing in prison. He has a hole in the rock. Just hole in the rock. Hey, the only running water in there was, you know what? Food got thrown in on the floor. He had to scrape it off the floor and eat it. Amongst the excrement and all the other garbage. Had a gate on it. You can't even imagine the squalor. And here's a man in there. Then hey, he, he didn't say, hey, can you turn the light on? Or could you open the window? Could you take the shades off the window? I mean, this man, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you I'm like Paul. I may become like him in hiding his writings in my heart. But what the Holy Spirit wants is for you to put the word in your heart and you make your own New Testament. He wants you to have a testament, a testimony. He wants you to have that so that you can boldly declare, let God be true and every man a liar. He wants you to have that. I'm just here to, how many times have I told this? I'm just here to prime the pump. Right? I've told you guys a story of my grandfather. Uh, you went out in his, his yard. He lived on the corner of Lima Goma Road and Irvin Road. And I go out there and I'd have to get a drink and he had a cup of water sitting on the pump. Did I say a cup of water or did I say a cup? If there was a cup, I ain't getting any water. There's a cup of water. And you start pumping this thing, and you pour that cup down in that pump, and all of a sudden water starts coming out. It's called priming the pump. That's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to help you get, that, get what's in you out of you. It's there. It not, maybe it's not here, but it's here because it cannot... Be not here if you're born again. That's why God said when he said, you have the mind of Christ. How is it possible that you got the mind of Christ? Because he's inside of you. And everything that's ever been done and everything that's ever been said and everything that's ever important in life for you is there. But you got to get it out. My job as a teacher is just to prime the pump. 
I can give you revelations. I can tell you all the great stories that God did for me, but it may not mean a thing to you other than you know in your heart that if you do something, God's going to bless you too. He ain't going to do it just for me. He walks it. He, he honors faith. Do you understand? He doesn't honor me talking to you. And all those wonderful stories are fine. Makes you feel warm and fuzzy. And that was a great story. And oh my gosh, I, I, I've heard several people, oh, wow, what a great story that was. And I said, but it's just a story. It's my experience. Yes, it's my experience of the word, but you've got to have your own. And you can't have it if you don't make him the Lord of your life. One of the greatest messages I've ever heard preach. And it was done at New Hope Christian Center. Actually, it was called Calvary Chapel of Praise, 1979, before it became New Hope. And the pastor of the church then did a teaching, Mel Stoffer. And he said, It's the wife's role to make you the Lord of their house. Of your house. And you can't find it in the word, anything other than that. It's not the role of the wife to be the Lord. It's her role to be your helpmate to teach you to be the Lord of your home. Of all the tens of thousands of messages I've heard, I remember two. That was one, and the second one was, Oh, no man anything except to love him. 1978. When God taught me how to be debt free. I was, set, I was 28 years old. By the time I was 30, I was debt free. I lived in my own home, this 2,000 square feet, brand new, brand new car, brand new El Camino, and I was debt free. And I started four years earlier with zero and had paid all my school debts, paid every bill, paid everything. I had bankers coming to me and saying, Doyle, what in the world are you doing paying off your school debt like that? 27 years old, I looked at in the eye and I said, it's my debt. I'm going to pay for it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if some godly men would be running this country? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Simple things. Just give me, the, give, give me the United States for just one year. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. I can do it. And I've, ha I've been asked to run dozens of times for politics, but I said, nope. That's not what God's called me to do. Why? Because this is what he's called me to do. Now, I wasn't doing this at the time, but I knew in my heart. That wasn't my role. We need men to have that role. I think we got some of them. We got some of them right here. And we need more. But if I'm going to make him the Lord of my life, I have to make the word the Lord of my life. Because in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can't say He's the Lord of your life without making the Word the Lord of your life, because they're the same thing. Do you understand? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. They're the same. So every day, I send you guys the Word, Jesus. Every day, five days a week, I write a teaching from Jesus. You can, I, I've had 
people call and say, you need to quit putting all that Bible stuff first and you need to put your message first because it's your message that's important. And I said, no, no, man. I mean, this guy was a, head of one of the largest Catholic organizations in the East Coast. He said, I'm in control so much. I know, I know what I'm doing. I write these things and I do this. I said, I really don't care. I give you four scriptures or more. I give you definitions. I give you the Greek, the Hebrew. I want you to study to show yourself approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you don't even have to read my stuff. Just close the book, go on. Because it says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's thy word that I want you to get in your head. It's thy word that I want you to put in your spirit. It's thy word that I want you to make real in your life because it's thy word that will make you more than a conqueror. Not my teaching. It's his word speaking to your heart, making revelation come alive to you. And it's how you react to that. And how you respond to that revelation, that's a key to life. That's what Jesus was talking about when he's talking to Peter. He said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. What rock was he talking about? Peter, the Catholic church? He was talking about flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. And upon this rock, Revelation, I'm going to build my church. That's why what I do is so important to you. Because it gives you a daily opportunity to renew your mind from someone who loves you. And I'm willing to give my life. I'm doing it. I'm doing it right now. You guys think I like doing this? I like. I could be down in Florida right now, with my feet up in the air. Of course, it's dark, but be on a beach, playing, goofing, having fun, because that's what everybody else is doing. But then I'd be a hypocrite, because I don't believe in that. I'm not going to condemn anybody, so don't get me wrong. That's not my point. My point is. We've got all this wisdom. Men spend 30, 40 years working, and they got all this wisdom. And so what they do is they pack up their car and go down to Florida and sit on the beach. When they could be teaching the young people, teaching and instructing and helping, giving the wisdom that they've gained, giving the knowledge that they've got. My God, oh my gosh. My grandfather carpentered till he was 89 years old. And he died at 97. And why, Grandpa? He said, because it's what I can do. He kept himself busy. Helped me. When he was 73 years old, I went to work for him. That's younger than I am. I didn't go to work for him, but I worked with him on the job. And we had a lot of nice talks. Did a lot of neat things. Had a great experience with him one time. I'm framing a wall up. Do you think I know how to swing a hammer? You don't think I did at that time? See that hammer right there? The, my wife thought I was leaving my tools around. I got a saw over there. That was my first saw I ever owned. 
I bought that in 1976. And, I can, and it still runs. This hammer here, you see what I'm doing? Am I using my arm? What am I using? My wrists are so powerful, men twice my size, I could put them right on their knees. And they'd get up and they'd say, what the heck? What was that? Sorry, man. Sorry, man. When you swing hammer all day long, do you think it gets strong? I was six foot three, weighed 190 pounds, and I had zero fat on my body. You know how heavy a three-quarter ton, three quarter ton group piece of plywood is? Ever carried one? Three quarter, three quarter plywood, ton group. Have you carried one of those? I carried two. I'd get done with a 10 hour workday and then I'd carry 40 square shingles up on a roof, on a two story. Did I like it? I hated it. I worked in Columbus. We framed apartments. We built apartments. So I did the grunt work. And I was a couple years later in 73. I'm framing a wall and I'm going, dink, bam. I drove the spike in one swing. Bam, wham, one swing. And I did right down the wall. Bam, 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 bam. And I looked up, my grandfather was looking at me like this. I said, what's wrong, Grandpa? He said, I've been carpentering all my life. I've never seen anybody do that before. I didn't think about it. I just did it. Because what they taught me to do. Those men that I worked for, they hated me. They hated what I stood for. They hated every inch of me. They were on my case. I talked to you guys about how I had to cut the plates out on an eight apartment, eight unit you know, apartment building. Every single plate on concrete and on up on the second floor had to cut every single plate out where the doorways were. And I was bleeding profusely down my legs. My shoes were all bloody. Did I like that? They made me do that. I said, you do that, get off the job. You're done, you're fired. I said, but man, they didn't have Sawzalls then, dudes. You guys are spoiled. I didn't always wear a suit or a sport coat. I had to learn to do the things I hate. You know why? Because I was going to college and it took me five years to get through. You know why? Because I had to pay 100% of my college education. That means my room and board. My senior year at Miami University, I lived in my car for eight weeks. I got mocked. I got made fun of because I pulled up to the dorms and got in my trunk and that's where I got my clothes to do my showers. I'd go into the dorms and shower and people started finding out what was going on. You know what I did? I said, I don't care one inch about you, dude. I don't care what you think, what you feel. I don't care one inch about you. I got mean and I got, I got very, I became like they were. I hated them. A 
Those are things I had to overcome. In 74, when I went back home, I had, I had to get all that out of my heart. Do you understand? I had to get that cut out of my heart. I didn't know what I'm teaching you. I didn't know nothing about it. I just knew I, I believed I'd be born again. That's it. That's all the Baptists taught you. They didn't teach you nothing else. That's what I was. And all my friends were Catholic. And they were told by a priest in the St. John's Gymnasium with me there and nine other guys from St. John's, the priest came out and said, don't you boys ever read the Bible. Never. I'll tell you what it says. So that's what I grew up with. Do they all believe that way? I have no idea. I haven't gone around and talked to every priest of you guys. I haven't talked to every Baptist preacher of you guys. I'm telling you that's what I experienced. So there's some things that I was confused about. And my story goes on and on and on. That's just up to the point when I started my business. And all that was there to bring me to this place so that I can teach you. And there ain't any of you that have lived a tougher life, a lower life than I have. Some of you have been there. I venture to say there's not a single man that raised their hand that say they lived in their car the, during eight weeks of their college life. And when I found the place to live, my mom and dad came down. And they walked up the stairway, and I greeted them. I opened the door, and my mom looked inside, and she said, I'm not going in there. She turned around and went back downstairs. I had holes in the plaster two feet in diameter. Rat infested. Pay good money. That's the kind of landlords you get at some of these universities. And I had men try to get me become slumlord landlords here in, in Lima. So I'll make you multi, multi millionaire. You just do what I ask you to do. And I said, nope. I said, I don't care about your money. You see how God builds compassion in you? Every experience, fellas, every experience that you've ever had is there to mold and shape you to be like Christ. Because God knows you. I don't know you. And I don't have to. I just praise God. I can just teach the word. And let the Holy Spirit talk to you. I don't have to do anything. I have no judgment over any man. None. I don't care who you are. You can, you can say the ugliest things in the world about me. I just say, well. He has an opinion. What good is an opinion? What, Joe? And that's how you need to see life when the voice is speaking to you, telling you that you'll never amount to anything. And you can say, devil, I know who you are. And your opinion don't count. That voice that wakes you up in the morning and tells you how things are falling apart and things ain't working and they ain't going to go right. You know that voice? You get up and get on your feet. And you say, Father, I thank you that you have my hands and my feet, my eyes, my ears, my thought life. You have my tongue today. And let's go whip on this guy. Because everything he said to me is a lie. And that's what I choose to believe. 
You see how you use the word? The Bible says the word is working mightily in me. What's the song? No matter what my circumstances, what I see or feel, feel or see, the work, word is working mightily in me. Is it? That's the question. Are you allowing it to do that? Because you are a free moral agent and you have to allow it to work in you. It's not going to happen naturally. You have to do what I said and you have to say, Lord, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I am trusting you as my Lord. And when he spoke to me in 1983 and he said, I am going to bless you in a sun-scorched land. That was faith, man. I couldn't see it. Everything around me was yelling and screaming at me saying, that's not ever going to work. You're a fool on a fool's errand. And I said, Lord, what did Jesus say to God, his father? Not my will, but thine be done. I'll drink this cup. That's why I know that I know that I know that God is going to turn this city upside down. And I don't have a clue how he's going to do it. And I really don't care because it's none of my business. You know what my business is? What is it? To be faithful in the little things. And he'll make you ruler over much. You can put down those parties in the park. You can put down the bicycles. You can put down the, the paying off of mortgages and the blessing the men and that family promise. You can put down all the things that seem like they don't make much hill of being. It's a difference. And you just say, not my will, but your will, Lord. I got this job I hate, not my will, Lord, but your will. I got this wife that's all screwed up, not my will, Lord, but your will. I'll drink the cup because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'll drink the cup and you will mold me and shape me and make me and everything that you want, that's lordship. Not what you want, not your will, but his. You gonna behave? <laughs> that's the orangiest looking grin I think you've ever seen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you that you love us so much that you gave your son. Not just for our sin, but for our freedom, for our sickness, our disease, our poverty, our weaknesses, our inadequacies, our past failures. So you paid the price. That all those things can be restored back to us. Everything the devil has stolen from us in our lifetime. You not only will restore it, but you'll restore it sevenfold if we'll just believe that we receive. In Jesus' name. Sir, we thank you and praise you for it. It's all about you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Gentlemen, is there anybody?